our last member webinar for 2014. My name is Ann Ackerson, and I serve COSA as its executive director. I'm sitting in a little office in Albany, New York, where it's kind of cold outside, uh, but sunny. And we're delighted to have you all with us today uh, to uh, talk about the, the work of the, the call committee, the Committee on Archives, Libraries, and Museums. Over to, to our moderator today, Susan Lugo. I just want to say that I want to thank Susan for pulling this uh, webinar together. She uh, was instrumental in developing this webinar and reaching out to the Calm folks on her chairmanship as COSA's uh, program committee chair. So, Susan, thank you for that. Um, I just to advance the slide here. Um, this is Partnering for Public Impact. Uh, and I also want to just briefly note that on the right side of your screen, you have a question, a Q&A box where you can post questions, and you also have a chat box, and you can post questions there as well. And we'll be moderating those boxes uh, throughout the webinar and um, making sure that any questions that you have will get to the right presenters. Susan, I want to turn the webinar over to you, uh, and thank you once again for the, all the work you've done on the webinars this year. We've had a full, full schedule, great webinars. We've had um, almost 400 people attend uh, the webinars uh, this year. We run member webinars from January to October and take the last two months uh, off to plan, to plan for the next year, to finalize the next year's webinars, and we've got some more information later in the program about the 2015 webinar schedule. So, Sin, welcome. Thank you. Nice introduction, and um, folks, myself and to the webinars, which are so important for COSA's program committee. Uh, and I don't for, for a moment when she says any time is taken off by anybody. This this can works year round, and as does Anne on a number. Of Committee, so it's a good hard working group, and I think you'll see some of those results today. So, good again to everyone, it's my pleasure and privilege as a proud and former member of the COSA Program Committee to welcome you to today's webinar on partnering for public impact, arts, libraries, and museums, featuring presentations by key members of the joint AAAAM Committee on Archives, Libraries, and Museums, better known as CALM. Dan Plum will lead off today giving us some background on CALM and its formation. Dan is a digital collections consultant working cultural heritage institutions interested in putting their collections online. He teaches graduate level classes on metadata, exhibits, and digital curation and preservation for the University of North Texas College of Information, the University of Texas at Austin School of Information, and Public History Program at Texas State University. He served as the ALA co-chair for COM from 2012 to 2014 and has participated on the committee as a guest or member since 2006. Now from Caroline Shepherd, the State Librarian of North Carolina, about the Coalition to Advance Learning in Archives, Libraries, and Museums. Cal's formerly the program director of Consulting Services and Regional Director for the Southeast at Lyricist. And in this, she managed the entire consulting program and also served as a consultant herself. From 1999 to 2006, she managed the Educational Services Program at Solomet. Prior to joining Solomet, Cal served as Chief of Library Development at the State Library of North Carolina. Cal has an LS degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a BA degree from the University of Colorado at Boulder. She's also active in the Chief Officers of State Library Agencies Organization and the American Library Association. Since 2014, Cal member Christian DuPont has served as Burns Librarian and Associate University Librarian for Special Collections at Boston College. Prior to turn to academic librarianship, for the last six years at the Systems, Virginia-based library software development firm create and promote Aon, the first online user and request workflow management systems 
specifically designed for special collections, libraries, and archives. Christian's work with Atlas and Aeon fed his interest in assessment and statistics, leading to organize a number of conference presentations, publications, and related initiatives. Form and is currently co-chairing a task force of the Society of American Archivists and the Association of College and Research Libraries, ACRL, with creating statistical measures for public services in archival repositories and special collections libraries. He's also serving a new libraries on a new libraries, um, sorry, new archive statistics working group of the National Organization for Standardization, or ISO. And his presentation today will introduce us to new statistics, measures, and standards for archives and special collections. Our attention to the future of COM, Elizabeth Call will be our final presenter in today's program. Elizabeth Public Services Librarian at the Burke Library of Columbia University. Her current position, she was head of reference and user services at the Brooklyn Historical Society. Elizabeth holds a BA in history from the State University of New York at New Paltz, an MA in public history from New York University, and an MS from the Palmer School of Library and Information Science at Long Island University. She is an active member and serves on several committees of the Rare Book and Manuscript Section of the Association of College and Research Libraries since the World of Special Collections 10 years ago. She has recently been appointed co-chair of COM. We love you today, and Danielle, we'd like you to lead us off if you would. Thank you, I am coming to you from Austin, Texas, and uh, I have to say that it is a little ironic that I am, for the first time, not a member of CALM for many years. So I've been a member, but I just want to introduce you briefly to CALM and what its purpose is, and then you'll have an opportunity to hear from some of the types of things that CALM tries to get out and promote. So CALM is an organization that is focused on archives, libraries, and museums. Established in 1970, the Special Committee of the American Library Association and the Society of American Archivists. And a lot of the, the work that was being done was in the area of joint standards and generally trying to keep the two groups in sync with each other. In 74, its importance was recognized as it became a standing joint committee of SA and ALA, and it's continued as a standing joint committee ever since. So now, basically, 40 years old. And three, the American Association of Museums, which is now called the American Alliance of Museums, was added as a third member, and that was done largely at the request of IMLS, who saw the value of CALM and really wanted to start including museums and, and fostering communications between all their constituencies of CALM, according to parent organizations, is that the common purpose of libraries, archives, and museums is to acquire, preserve, and promote the use and appreciation of collections that document the range of human expression, experience, and knowledge. In order to promote cooperation among professionals of all types of collecting holding, collections holding organizations, it is desirable to strengthen communication among the American Library Association, the Society of American Archivists, and the American Alliance of Museums, and to make the goals and activities of the three organizations. The activities that CALM is charged with are to Foster health ways and means of affecting closer cooperation among the organizations, the establishment of common standards, to that such activities as are assigned to the committee by any of its parent bodies. Programs of a relevant and timely nature at the annual meetings of one or more parent bodies, and to refer matters of common concern to appropriate committees of ALA. SA, or AM. As you can see, COM is, has a very wide-ranging charge uh, and can do a lot of different types of things. One of the most important things that COM does and has done for many years is just to promote communication among the appropriate individuals so that the right hand knows what the left hand is doing. 
how it's organized, uh, well, this is the formal way it's organized. There are five members appointed by each organization. In 1985, the chair of COM alternated biennially between ALA and SAA, but after 85, uh, there were co-chairs appointed by each organization, and they served two-year terms. So I was with the ALA co-chair. I had a counterpart from SAA, a Su Kim Chung, who did wonderful work uh, me, and we got a lot done. Um, it, the American Alliance of Museums has been mostly a silent partner. Uh, Nanny Set, who is uh, now with the Balboa Park Online, uh, has served as a de facto member, as a member of the AAM Executive Committee. Um, there, they have not actually been appointing members for quite some time, so it's primarily SAA and ALI. In addition to the formal members, we have had liaisons appointed from the ALA, ACRL, Rare Book, and Manuscript section, the ALA, uh, which is uh, Library Collections and Technical Services Association, their Preservation and Reformatting section, we have liaisons from IMLS in an informal capacity, and also informally from COSA, and Susan has actually been doing a lot of that work as well. It's always good to, to get her uh, online when, when we can. Formally, three times, but in reality, four times a year at the ALA Midwinter Meeting. This year, it will be in Chicago at the end of January. At the American Alliance of Museums Annual Meeting, which is held, will be held this coming year in Atlanta, Georgia. At the ALA Annual Meeting, which will be held the end of June in San Francisco, and that's our, our, we have a meeting, but it's not formally one of the meetings. But since ALA is ha always happy to give us the slot, we've taken advantage of it. And then at the SAA Annual Meeting, which is held in August this year in Cleveland. For information about CALM, unfortunately, there, we maintain a lot of different websites because of the nature of the committee. The main sites I will point you to are the info.ala.org slash CALM page, which has facts about the committee, including a lot of this history, and the SAA official page, which is, a, we are a committee of SAA, so you can find us through their organization site. We have uh, also sites on the ALA Connect online community. And we have a microsite through SAA. Those two sites are where we tend to put things like agendas and minutes of our meetings, announcements about programs, and, and that kind of detail. We own a fairly active email list. Uh, and if you're interested in signing up for that, it is open. Uh, so you can. Sign yourself up online by going to list.ala.org. Archive committee, archives JTCTE, or sending an email to Karen Muller, the ALA librarian, and her email is kmuller at ala.org. So I encourage you all to join us and follow along. Uh, we do get reports, find out about interesting projects, and then try to feed that information on. And that light, when asked for a session uh, about COM, we said, well, we don't really want to do a session about COM. Let's do it uh, and focus on focusing on some of the cooperative projects that COM tends to follow and promote. And in that light, I am going to um, Actually, change the order of the slides, Elizabeth. Do you want to go forward, or do you to uh, go over this? Um, I'm just going to go. All right. Um, I can I just advance them, and then we can come back to you. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> um, yes, we're going to go over to Cal Shepard, uh, who's with the State Library of North Carolina, to talk about um, what was at one point being called CLAM. Um, <laughs> get both calm and clam in one session. And here I am in beautiful North Carolina, right down the hall from Sarah Kuntz, the North Carolina State Archivist. Hello, Sarah. 
And to all of you, I'm happy to be here today, and I want to fill you in about this exciting project called the Coalition to Advance Learning in Live Archives and Museums. So I have missed stay leave here, but we keep changing our names. So, but anyway, you get the drift. This is a project that has been designed to help libraries, archives, and museums work together in the field of continuing education. It's funded by IMLS, and I have heard the director of IMLS say that she keeps funding the same types of uh, projects in different states. Every state library wants to do its own leadership training. We just get together and share what we're working on. So this is a, a ambitious project to see if it's possible to share continuing education professional development programs between and among the sectors of museums, libraries, and archives. It's been really interesting to be a member of the to represent the chief officers of state library agencies or the state librarians across the country on the coalition. It was by invitation. And so they invited at the beginning a broad array of members from the three different sectors. Interestingly, so there were a uh, majority, frankly, were librarians, and then there were some uh, museum representatives and just a few archives representatives. And that has had a big impact on the way this program has moved forward, and I'm going to tell you more about that in just a minute. The funding was a grant from IMLS that was made to OCLC for management services. And OCLC has contracted with Burke Consulting to keep us all on track and to keep us moving forward. Uh, people spread out all over the country, and all of our meetings conducted virtually. Burke has a tough job, I'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, current members, uh, as of October, now this is just half of them, but you can see most of the people on this list are the library sector. We did have Kathleen Rowe from SAA, but generally in the first few meetings we were discussing we are, how we're going to work together, it came out fairly strongly that the on the committee felt underrepresented. So we have actually dealt with that. I have devised a way to add members. So I wanted to say right off the bat that COSA has been asked to join the coalition. And the representative is Matt Veach. It was just confirmed on the 24th of this month as full-fledged member of the coalition. Matt is a state archivist at Kansas State Historical Society. Uh, four more seats that, that can be added because of the cost for this. With a little extra money from IMLS to fund the addition of these members, the four other members are Still being, those positions are being filled. We had someone from the Association of Children's Museums who was very interested, and uh, right now, OC or Web Junction, Burke, and the members of the coalition are working to identify still new members. And most of the ideas for those new members are coming from the current archives and museums members on the coalition. I was actually at a meeting of COSLA just last week in Wyoming, and uh, one of the officers there was expressed interest in joining her her organization. She's also the state archivist. This is Daphne Leon and out somewhere. So I, I turned her name over to our contacts at OCLC, and I can tell you who those are. If, I, if you know of any organizations that might be interested, now is the time when they are taking names and considering who should be asked to join the coalition so that we have the best possible and possible representation. 
If any interested, I'll be glad to share those names. I can put them in the chat once I'm finished. Uh, who to contact to make a suggestion for adding members? This work that we're working on. Well, let me tell you, we've got three working groups in the coalition, and they are all working independently but sharing what they're doing with each other. So assessing the state of the field is the group that is working on what kind of needs are out there for code training. So not only is it co-developed, but it's also one of the visions is that it would be useful across sectors. So it's the kind of event that could be attended at the same time by representatives from archives and libraries and museums with the Implication being that we can learn from each other and all be better because we have um, a broader Assessing the state of the field has applied for and received uh, extra funding from IMLS to conduct an assessment over the course of the next year. They got $100,000 and they will be putting together a tool and stay tuned because we want representation on that needs assessment, of course. Support the coalition. This has been a really interesting group because they're the ones who are grappling with the differences in terminology between the different sectors. They nail down the operating principles. Those who are dealing with the whole representation issue of who has more people on the coalition, who has fewer, how do we work that they have developed the process for adding these new members. So they had a hard job because I can say I approach things from my perspective and working on this coalition, it's become very clear that we libraries have different perspectives from archives and museums. The resources group is the one that was charged with coming up with a prototype. They have not had success, and it, one of the there's real reasons for this. It goes back to just leaving the playing field and ha making sure we're all starting from the same place, but also coming to some agreement on a topic that would be of use and you to all three sectors. So that that group experienced some churn in their first several months of working together. We just recently have our second face-to-face -face meeting. So while most of our day-to-day -day work is done virtually, there have been two face-to-face -face convenings, one in the spring and again this fall. And I'm proud and happy to say that that prototype group has come forward. They have picked a, a topic, which is project proposal development, because all three sectors are in the positions going for grants, if not from IMLS, then from other organizations, and we could all benefit from being project proposals. Bob Horton, bless his heart, at IMLS is being very involved in that. Um, I was just reviewing their minutes today, and they're actually going to take, I believe, some existing content from maybe George Mason University and it for the sectors. So the three working groups are moving along and progress. I submitted these slides. We were talking a lot about the joint strategy. I want to point out the second bullet because this is where we have had to spend a lot of time um, developing a firm basis for collaboration within and across sectors. And this just on the committee that's planning this stuff. So it's a lot harder than it seems. And in fact, I was doing a, a, a presentation on this, the chief officers at their meeting last week, and Susan Hildreth stood up and she said, well, if it had been, if we thought it was gonna be easy, we've done it ourselves year, years ago. So she's happy that we are making progress and we are perhaps not as quickly as we anticipated, but we are. Um, is a shared resources group looking to international models? Interesting question. I, group. 
I do not. I don't. I don't know what the answer to that question is, but your new representative from COSA to the coalition might be able to look at that for you. You just getting started. It's so early in the game that perhaps they have not. But your Susan, you're leading me to my next. Which is there is one more project that I wanted you all to be aware of, and that project is looking at international models. It is called the Nexus Two Project, and it is growing out of the Nexus One Project, which is a project to the coalition in that it is looking at shared continuing education professional development resources across three sectors. But this project is looking specifically at leader development. They are looking at international models. I know that. They have just been funded. Uh, they got an almost $400,000 three-year grant from IMLS to undertake these, this project. And Ackerson of COSA is a team on the team that is planning Nexus. and. Uh, they are just getting started. They were the grant was awarded, I think, this month. May it started October one. So right now they're just in getting up and going mode. We're trying to pick times for meetings and all of that sort of thing. But this is an exciting project. It will impact all three of the sectors, and I encourage you to keep your eyes on it. And whenever I talk about the coalition, I always mention Nexus too, because to me they're sort of hand in hand. And that is all that I have to say about the coalition. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions about these projects. Uh, I will certainly tell you if I know the answer, and I will certainly tell you if I don't know the answer. I'm thrilled to be here today, though, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the presentation. Hi, this is Christian DuPont speaking to you from my relatively new and cavernous office here at Boston College. I hope you can hear me well enough uh, despite the echoes that I know that you're getting in the background. Uh, I have been mostly an academic librarian through my career, and that's what I'm returning to do now here at Boston College. But uh, as a special collections librarian, I have a lot of experience working with archives and, and also with my previous experience working with Atlas Systems and our Aeon uh, software project there, a lot of uh, experience working with other institutions, uh, including archives, pure archives, and museums as well. So, uh, and as a uh, previous uh, uh, Co-chair of COM, I'm pleased to be invited to, uh, to join the seminar this afternoon. Uh, we're going to take a little different uh, topic and tack here. We're going to be talking about assessment and the statistical measures and standards that uh, uh, support such assessment. Um, so let's think about um, assessment. And in the library world, it's a big phrase these days, library assessment. So translate that to archives assessment or museums assessment. We're all uh, focused on demonstrating the value and impact of our institutions. Um, but what does that really mean, and how do we do that? Um, why should we care? So I find it helpful sometimes when talking with staff that I'm working with or those uh, funding agencies or uh, administrators uh, about our initiatives around assessment by translating that word a little bit. And, and I found it helpful to talk about assessment uh, as being about insight and change. So let's break that down a little further. Insight, seeing into things. You could be seeing into data big data, the, all the uh, statistical information that we'd be collecting or could be collecting is one form of insight. Um, and then the patterns that emerge from that. So we really understand, you know, how our users are interacting with our, our services, uh, what they're getting from our collections, uh, and our operational needs as well. Sometimes assessment confirms things we know, and other times uh, it gives us new insights. Assessment is also very much about change. And, and whenever I start thinking about planning an assessment project or uh, supporting those who are doing it, I really begin with 
the question, you know, what is it I want to change or would you like to change? Uh, because assessment can be not very meaningful if we uh, come with some sort of abstract assess uh, approach and are just simply gathering statistics and doing kind of annual reporting and that sort of thing. Assessment is really about improvement and uh, change-driven improvement. So an assessment is also very much about culture, and sometimes it's the culture that has to change first in order to really uh, engage in meaningful assessment activities. So, and again, a translation exercise. Sometimes, you know, culture is a scary word for people. So talking about transforming attitudes or kind of a mindset or an ambiance in which we're going to be evaluating our services. Uh, Outcomes-oriented thinking can resonate well with some, or maybe it's really about pursuing customer satisfaction or uh, a greater fulfillment for our staff uh, as well as our users. So that's a framework in which I like to approach assessment. Um, assessment, looking more internally now, of course, is the measures we're going to be using is, is about performance, certainly. Um, and there's also uh, performance, of course, is also about metrics. How do you measure performance? Um, performance about metrics? Well, what are metrics and how do you support metrics? Uh, metrics involve standardized statistical measures. So let's focus on that a little bit more. Standard statistical measures. Uh, something that we have lacked in the archives and the library and museums community as well. In the archives community, we have uh, descriptive standards for uh, managing our archives, you know, DAX in, in our U.S. context or ISAT-G in an international context and, and uh, other metadata standards that help us manage our collections. Uh, what we lack really are operational metrics, and this has been demonstrated uh, recently with some of these reports, even from 2010, taking our Pulse, the OCLC Research Survey, um, a, uh, a study of the value of academic libraries is undertaken by the Association of College and Research Libraries. IMLS has been funding um, investigations of library value through return on investment studies uh, through the Association of Research Libraries. Let's just take the first one as an example here. So the OCLC, OCLC Research Survey, uh, mainly on academic archives, so you may not be as familiar with it as a state archivist, but, um, you know, not surprised by the findings, right? So in our key findings, you know, the, the report, you know, a lack of established metrics limits the collecting, analyzing, especially comparing of statistics across the special collections and, again, archives community. We just lack the kind of norms for assessing user services archival processing and production. Um, so this really you know, spawns some action initiatives here to develop and promulgate metrics. This is something the archives community has, has tried at various times and failed at. Uh, there are efforts that go back even to the 1940s and then again in the 1960s in the Society of American Archivists that never led to the kind of operational uh, statistical standards that, um, that I'll be uh, hopefully helping uh, others to, uh, to create now in the, in the coming couple of years. So one way to get this uh, initiative relaunched uh, within the Special Collections Library Archives community uh, was through the Rare Books and Manuscripts section of the Association of College and Research Libraries, an organization like myself and Liz, Danielle, and Nicole have been very involved with um, being an organizational professional at home. So we launched a, a metrics and assessment task force um, it was back a couple of years now, and the, uh, charged it with doing a kind of environmental stand, looking at what are the metrics that we currently have to work with when it comes to collections, cataloging, and processing. Uh, similarly, for conservation, preservation, exhibits, even exhibit loans, we got a third subgroup of our task force working on instruction and reference, um, and a fourth one on kind of users and use. Uh, of our collection. So looking at what standards already exist and then, of course, where are the gaps? And we've not surprisingly found many of them. So then we uh, took the next step of, of um, you know, moving from a preliminary sort of investigative environmental scan task force uh, to engaging task force to actually create uh, some of these uh, metrics where there were gaps that were found. And to do this, we decided, of course, not to just limit ourselves to working in um, the library environment or the archives environment, but to really join forces. So um, it took uh, some organizational, um, you know, efforts and collaboration. Calm actually played a very helpful role in mediating conversations between the leadership of the Society of American Archives and our ACRB mass leadership to form.
form joint task forces. Um, of course, you know, we're talking about the land environment here. What about museums? Well, uh, we discovered in talking, uh, again, conversations with Com and, and uh, friends in the, uh, in the museum community that the kind of operational statistics uh, and standardized uh, approaches that we wanted to work with in the library archives environment didn't translate as immediately well to the uh, uh, museums um, uh, organizations, and they also had a different way of approaching the endorsement development and endorsement of standards. So we certainly we will keep the museum community in, in view uh, as we develop our standards, but this is really something for us as archivists and librarians. So uh, there are two task forces that uh, have been launched just this fall. Uh, the first one is a joint task force on holdings metrics, and basically these are descriptions of um, the guidelines that will by definitions and best practices, sorry, for uh, quantifying the holdings of archival repositories. Um, in libraries, we've got our standards about how to count volumes. Archive, we can look at a number of boxes, containers, but how do we describe other formats of material that are held in analog or digital form, audiovisual materials in our collections? So they're counting in them in similar ways. So that when we go to apply for grants or making our case, you know, in a heritage preservation initiative, let's say, that we're speaking the same language and are really quantifying our material the same way. So some basic work here. And we have a, a 10 member joint task force, five members from SAA, five members from ACRL RBMS that have been, you know, officially appointed to, uh, to develop um, these statistical standards here related to holdings metrics. And that's uh, just getting underway now and we're envisioning at least a two year timeline to get that draft standard out into the community um, for, uh, for review and input and eventually endorsement. Uh, similarly, we've launched a task force on public services metrics. This is one that I'm co-chairing uh, with my colleague Amy Schindler from Omaha um, um, on standardized statistical metrics for public services. So this is the kind of thing, how do we exactly count visits to the archives? Um, how do we count the circulation in terms of reading room uh, paging requests uh, into our archives? Uh, reference transactions, again, to standardize the way that we're uh, counting these things. At a basic level, but how do you, necessary for supporting uh, assessment initiatives? And there you can see some of the highlights from our charge there the, uh, uh, that we're going to be focused on. Same line over the next two years. There were, if you remember, two other areas that were identified as needing uh, attention in our archives and, and library communities for standards development. Um, and uh, this one relates to educational outreach. Um, and uh, of course, has been talking about uh, a coalition effort to, around things. But this, uh, uh, in the ACRL context, uh, this is one where the library community is, is kind of uh, taking a lead and, and uh, uh, at this point, independently of the Society of American Arts to develop what we call um, new uh, information literacy competency standards. So this, again, kind of comes a little bit more from the academic or public libraries focus, but it's something to keep on the radar, I think, for you and as, as an archivist um, in that public history role. How do we gauge the effectiveness of our teaching and also provide guidelines on, on how to, um, uh, to teach with primary sources? So, in fact, SA has had a group um, on teaching with primary sources. It's been working group, the reference access and outreach section. So if you want to, if you're involved in SAA, want to learn more about these efforts uh, through SAA, uh, talk to the RAO section leaders and learn more about this initiative. You can download uh, the report on teaching with primary sources. Um, and it parallels in many ways things that we're doing in the uh, uh, special collections library community. And, and we do see uh, joining forces at some point, although that we don't have any uh, joint course immediately at this point. Uh, but we are sort of seeing some joint publications. Uh, one book that uh, came out uh, uh, recently here, Hands-On Instructional Exercises, How to Use Primary Resources. This handbook uh, includes contributions from archivists as well as librarians and even some who work in museum environments. So it's really um, a reflection of, uh, of, our, of our blended communities these days and the work that we're doing. Um, one last area would be preservation statistics. And uh, in here, um, I think it was uh, Danielle who mentioned earlier ALEX is the acronym for the uh, uh, Library Cataloging Technical Services Division of the American Library Association, which is the home for presentation uh, uh, statistics. 
metrics and the, uh, the preservation and reformatting section uh, to be aware there are uh, statistical standards that are being promoted um, uh, now in surveys, annual surveys. And this, uh, there was an attempt to really be inclusive of archives um, during earlier iterations of this preservation statistics uh, instrument that's being promoted now in the library community. Uh, it didn't work as well for both communities, so there's kind of less joint effort happening these days. But you know, I think it's something that to be aware of and to pay attention to, um, and I can certainly, along with others, provide more information that may be relevant to you um, as, as COSA members. Um, one last thing I'll mention here is um, uh, the uh, on an international level, there's actually this kind of alignment uh, uh, and uh, recognition of the need for uh, developing statistical statistical standards for archives in an international context, again, to support um, assessment initiatives. So uh, in a national framework, that means the uh, International Organization for Standardization, uh, whose uh, acronym is ISO. Uh, and of course, in the United States, that is with uh, NISO and ANSI as our national standards bodies uh, that are then members of ISO and, and um, appoint uh, experts um, you know, in fields to work on developing these, uh, uh, again, uh, standards efforts, uh, some of which are statistical standards, like this new working group that has been launched. So uh, I'm one of many, many people who have been uh, uh, appointed to uh, uh, this working group and uh, participated recently in uh, some meetings we had in Berlin where kind of at the early drafting stage defining uh, what definitions need to be defined and from there we'll be developing um, uh, this, uh, statistics that will um, uh, archives will use to describe their activities and they'll actually uh, I think uh, dovetail very nicely with the things that we're doing between SAA and RBMS so another standards efforts to be aware of um, and with that I'll close and um, uh, certainly glad to uh, answer uh, questions about any of these initiatives during our Q&A time here, um, and you will have my email address and the slides, and I'm really happy to follow up with you in much more detail as you'd like uh, at any time. Hello, as mentioned, my name is Elizabeth Call, and I'm the current co-chair of, of COM. Um, and as um, I went through a lot of the history, so I'm not going to go too much into that. Um, but what excited me about COM um, when I heard it was just that, you know, the, the interconnectedness and the ability to go to a meeting that talked about the interconnectedness of the three organizations, um, the library and archives and NEMS. And, um, you know, really um, what I find would be really powerful is being able to create a space where these interconnected conversations can happen. Um, you know, all of these organizations have conferences and um, not all of us can afford to financially go to all these conferences or even have the time to go to all these conferences. So this come at the, that when we meet at ALA and at FAA, we're able to um, hopefully fill people in with what we're all doing. Um, so really one of my um, main goals um, as coaches to just continue on creating more awareness of COM and become, uh, so we can become a more dependable contact clearinghouse for matters that overlap between AA, SA, and AM. Um, so, uh, strategies I want to put in place, um, again, it's all about outreach and social media. Um, we do actually have a Twitter feed. Um, COM has a Twitter feed, and I didn't even know about that. Um, our contact at ALA, um, Karen Moeller had mentioned it, and we actually have over 600 followers, which is pretty impressive, because um, even here at the Burke, uh, I managed a Twitter feed here, we only have a couple hundred. Um, but interesting enough, even though we have 600 followers, whenever I speak to colleagues in, that are involved with RBMS, never heard of COM. So I think there, you know, how can we, um, how can we use Twitter more effectively to get people who are in these conversations, having these conversations, guiding these conversations, um, to, to be aware that we exist. Um, so another method I try to use is, um, along with the social media, is creating and using appropriate hashtags at conferences and just being consistent about it. Um, talking about COM to colleagues, um, as mentioned, I'm pretty involved with RBMS and continuing to talk about it and um, the, the meetings and trying to get more people to come to the meetings at uh, Midwinter, ALA Annual, and also SAA. Um, investigate and advocate for better technology at ALA and SAA annual meetings to be able to better include our virtual participants. Um, so people, we are a committee that allows virtual participation. 
Um, but the technology that's been um, offered so far is kind of inadequate. In fact, we actually don't get any support from LA or SAA to um, facilitate virtual participation, so I kind of want to investigate what are our options. I know Danielle's done a lot of work with that, and I just want to see if there's anything more that can be done. Because um, I know, for example, I can't really go to SAA, but I go to ALA, so how can I participate in that meeting virtually? Um, I want to try to use, um, utilize our interns. We just recently have um, been given ALA. We get two interns, I believe, every two years. And each intern has a different, they're stagnant. They start and stop at different times. But at every given time, we should have two interns. And currently, we have two, and they've both reached out to me. So I want to figure out some ways of um, using interns and having you have interns to be part of the process of planning the programs at the annual meetings and also have them um, participate in the social media outreach. Um, so as said, uh, Daniel mentioned, we do because, um, put on programs at each of the annual, that's the goal, each have a program at AAM, ALA, and SAA. Um, for the last few years, there hasn't been a program at AAM, um, but we have had um, some FOCOM program at ALA and SAA annual. Um, so just wanted to highlight the um, programs that we have on board coming up this um, summer. So ALA annual 2015, um, we don't have the exact meeting date we just put in, um, so I'm not sure, but it can be anywhere between June 25th and June 30th. Um, in San Francisco, the program for COM is going to be called Double Dutch Explorations and Hybrid Primary Source Instruction. And, the, um, and this is very much a draft, but the abstract for that is um, we're going to be examining the um, pedagogical approaches of using digital and print um, and how they differ and how can these differences be woven together into a cohesive experience? Who is involved in creating these experiences? Um, this panel will examine various aspects of the conversation around hybrid approaches to instruction with primary sources. And panelists will offer varied perspectives, including both their successes at teaching with primary sources and the pitfalls they have encountered along the way. Um, and we have interesting, a good uh, mixed panel of um, archivists and librarians. Uh, the next one, uh, the one that was put together by my co-chair, uh, my fellow co-chair, uh, Jean Green, um, is uh, for FAA is called Students as Curators, Primary Sources and Digital Exhibits. And that panel um, will be, um, the ad for that is integrating primary sources into curation and the creation uh, and how that can help a student envision and approach these materials, both as a historian and as an artist. How have new technologies and alternative um, spaces expanded the field of curation? How does curating as an activity relate to a digital world? And how does this experience apply to digital exhibits? What makes a good digital exhibit? And how is digital exhibits differ, different from a physical one? Um, and it goes on. There's a lot more questions. But I just wanted to kind of let you guys know that this is what's on board for um, 2015. Um, and the annual program will be August 16th through August 22nd. Okay. Um, Daniel um, also pointed out, oh, this is my cheesy little slide. I kind of thought it would be funny. Um, keep calming and working together. Um, and then our uh, question, so if you have questions, please let me know. But here's my contact info as well as our Twitter um, handle and also some of the same websites that Daniel pointed out to you at the beginning. Thank you much. All our presenters today, and I hope that those of you who have questions will start putting those in the chat box. Um, I haven't been monitoring Q and A. Let me take a look. Uh, nothing's there, so do use the chat box if you have some questions. And I know I've written down a couple of things, and in the short time that we have remaining, I will try and get in as many of these as possible. Um, one question to all of you: probably know this answer. Um, the using primary resources uh, book that. Um, was referred to Christian. How can that be purchased? Uh, the Making Primary Sources book is published uh, um, um, by uh, Libraries Unlimited is where you can find that from that website. But uh, I'm pretty sure it's distributed by Amazon as well, so it's an easy book to find. Uh, do you have the slide there if you want to go back to, to show it or show the cover for people to jot down the title there? Um, I can't do anything. She's very good. <laughs> There are big primary sources, hands-on instructional exercises, the authors, Ann Beatty, Heather Smedberg, and Mary uh, Taramina, the editors. There are about 30 contributors overall. And it's not being linked off of the COM website right then? Uh, I don't believe there's a link there off of the COM okay. website. Yep. So 
Sorry, I brought up the- I think primary sources and hands-on instructional exercises will come up with it pretty quickly. I think it's it is a um, it's a large format book. It's uh, kind of a workbook style. There, it's uh, um, I believe the cost is about fifty dollars. I think. Well, and it's age appropriate for several groups that aimed at our, our um, university crowd. What? More at um, uh, call it, yeah, university crowd or that age level, so there are not really exercises that are designed for working with, uh, you know, grade school students or, um, you know. But you might find some inspiration in that. There might be some sample chapter things you can look at. It is kind of a, a cookbook that actually. So you know, there's several the short section. Here's how to set up the exercise. Here's kind of the ingredients almost that you need, you know, to use it. Here's how you can use, uh, you know, um, you know documents to, to do a particular type of exercise and very creative, different approaches there and some narrative of how they could work. So um, it may be translatable. I know that they thought about that a lot in the scope here is, you know, what kind of book are we writing? And it was, you know, as you, one of those discussions with the publishers there. And so um, I know their interests are broader, but this book tends to be focused more at the, um, uh, call at least the college and high school level. And we always uh, look for a using primary sources part two to come maybe to address those audiences as well. Elizabeth Call has put the link for Amazon uh, in the chat box if you're interested. Right. And I also... Uh, if you could go back, if I, uh, just to, to, sorry to speak over your words there, Becca, but there's um, the other slide there, if we go back, uh, or is it going forward? This one here, Teaching with Primary Sources, okay? Um, this report includes bibliography or there are other bibliography documents that this group has done, and there are, you know, so books and lots of articles, and, and many of those will, you know, from the SAA community, um, in, be more inclusive in terms of uh, institutional types, public, uh, you know, archives, public history programs that, that span age group levels as well. So right. that would be a better source. So, okay. Thank you, Christian. Yeah. I also wanted to point out while we're waiting for additional questions to go into the chat box, or those who would like to simply unmute themselves and ask the presenter directly. Danielle has put in the chat box a question about the 2014 Heritage Health Index that it's just been launched, and she's given the link if you have to take the survey and give you the um, email address for any questions about that survey. Danielle, did you want to say any, a couple of words about that? Um, I'm not actually really formally um, part of the Connecting to Collections uh, effort at the, this point, but continues. You know, collecting, Connecting to Collections was the effort that IMLS launched following the 2004 Heritage Health Index to continue to focus on collections care resources. And they're continuing to work with um, various organizations to try to keep connection, collections care resources available. The 2014 Heritage Health Index is funded by IMLS, NEH, and several other groups. And the goal is to update the information they gathered as part of the 2004 Heritage Health Index. But actually what's really exciting is that they've expanded it. They're basically letting anyone take it. The, the 2004, they had a very a targeted audience. They wanted to make sure they were collecting a statistically valid baseline of data. And now they want to get as much data as possible so that they can compare and that they can track over time what the status is. Um, Kristen has, has said a lot about, you know, empirical evidence for various things. And, and IMLS and other funders really see these kinds of surveys as a powerful weapon in their efforts to secure funding that can distribute uh, to all the states and territories to help arcs, libraries, museums, um, and other types of organizations, historical societies, and, and uh, humanities groups as well, through the collections that are entrusted to them. Yes, we do certainly encourage you to, to take the 2014 Health Index. It is not a short survey. Uh, it's something that you will want to allocate sufficient time to, uh, but if you can get enough data from it, um, this will continue to be a really valuable advocacy tool. Thank you, and I want to thank both you and Elizabeth for putting additional resource links into the chat box 
for uh, primary source teaching as well. Um, Dan touched just a moment ago about the comments that on the comments that Christian had made about the um, the uh, the traditions and the, the quantification and description of the value of our collections based from the three points of view. I wanted to ask anyone who wants to answer in the group, why do you think they use different metric traditions developed? Why are they different? Uh, and are, are some of those differences being dictated by what grantors want to see um, and measure success by? I'll turn to go since you've actually been studying. Okay. <laughs> sure. It's um, a short answer is that because of the way our professional organizations have developed um, kind of alongside of one another, that uh, and there hasn't at times been as much conversation you know, between them, and that we've tended to kind of go our own ways on these things and do things that you know make sense you know for us as archivists, for us as librarians, as museum professionals, um, and. You know, in that kind of more isolated environments, we, we don't do things that end up having the same kind of, you know, results to take on them. Um, and it's been this more conscious effort, uh, uh, as Daniel was going to get going back, you know, 40 years now, but, you know, it, it takes work. You know? And every time, you know, every, every new group that comes into conference has to find itself sort of re-explaining its purpose and, and uh, to a new group or a new generation has to understand what is the value and kind of working cross-organizationally in this way. So, um, but I think there's more momentum ever, uh, from what I can tell, at least, uh, you know, from going back in history a little bit. So I'm encouraged that this is, you know, a, uh, you know, kind of a permanent sea change, if you will, that we'll be working in, and it's something we can make happen. Um, and so to not be bogged down by kind of the, the shortcomings of the past and just keep looking ahead. Um, and I think that's the more important thing. Is, um, uh, and also the ways that we measure things now. We have more tools at our, at our disposal, more electronic tools, uh, tools for analysis. So it's just as well that we kind of in some ways really go back to the beginning and start over. Um, and, and not worry about why things didn't happen at one time or another. I hope that's a, a relevant answer to the question. I hope that it also leaves others with um, an interest in finding out more about the topic. And we'll use the resources that you all have provided at the end of your presentations to explore this more as we go forward. We Our time is up. Um, we have some announcements to make, but I want to thank all, all of our presenters from CALM for being with us today and for taking the time to explain to us about what you're doing and some of the important work that you've already begun. And we are very pleased to become partners with CALM in these efforts as we go forward and hope that we can all get from them. I'm sure we will. Thank you again. Um, I'm going to turn over now to Mary. Mary, who will give us some announcements about upcoming COSA events. And we invite all of you to stay through to the end because we have um, some announcements there, and uh, Mary, take it away. Thank you, Susan. Um, the Best Practices Exchange will be taking place next month in Montgomery, Alabama, from November 19th through the 21st. For more information, visit bpexchange.org. The new series webinar is left in the year. Uh, the next one will be held November 5th on Wednesday. Its topic is electronic record storage. And the next series webinar for 2014 will be held on Tuesday, December 9th, and they're looking at web archiving. While it is the last COSA member webinar for 2014, the COSA program committee has been hard at work coming up with a theme for next year's COSA webinar series. The theme that they've developed is project and program planning and management. And some of the topics that will be covered during the year, next year, are staff for performance, exigence from concept to opening, crowding projects, public programs, capital projects, and grid projects. There will be special SHRAB 40th anniversary conversations taking place, so something to look forward to. GEOSA's corporate partnerships provide critical funding support for many COSA membership activities and events. We are really grateful to Ancestry.com and our other corporate sponsors, FaithSearch, Gaylord, Hunter Metal Edge, The Media Reserve, History, and Preserve Ica. Support for COSA's program initiatives is also generously provided by grants from NHRC and ILS. Sit and inform with what COSA is up to. 
Visit us on our website at www.statearchivist.org or visit our COSA Resource Center. Also, subscribe to the COSA blog and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We appreciate your feedback. After you exit the webinar today, you will automatically be taken to an online webinar evaluation. Please take a couple of minutes to complete the survey and help us plan future webinars. That's today's webinar. Thank you for attending and enjoy the rest of your day.